This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show the legendary Scott Mosier. How are you doing, Scott? Uh, the legendary Scott Mosier didn't, is not here. <laughs> Well, then we'll just deal with the Scott Mosher that's in front of us. Yeah, Scott Mosher's here. Uh, I don't know about the legendary, but I'm good. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I've uh, I've been a fan of of your pro- your producing for a long time and your directing. My kids are now fans of your directing as well, which we'll get all into that uh, in a bit. But um, you know, many of uh, many of uh, my listeners know that you you know kind of got your start in Clerks. Uh, working with Kevin and getting that whole thing going. Um, I have to first tell you, when I first saw Clerks, because you and I are similar vintage uh, as far as age is concerned. So I am, I, you're, you're looking at, I'm about to, what's today? Uh, Friday, on Friday, I'm a week. So today is February 24th. So March 5th, I turned 50. I'm wow. like, so yeah. You're a little bit, you're just slightly a bit older. I'm 46. So we're we're in similar we, we we've crossed over the yeah. same bodies uh, yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the bits in the business. So um, when I first saw Clerks, I was so upset because I was working in a video store. <laughs> I was just uh, like, it was right in front of me. Why didn't I think of this? It was like literally, I was I worked in a video store for five years, and I was just like, God <laughs> damn it, man! I was so upset at myself. I'm like, why oh, hadn't I thought of that? That, but you guys. You guys did it. So how did you get involved with Kevin? How did you get involved with Clerks and, and that whole kind of crazy story? So, I mean, you know, I backing it up. like I was probably, I guess I was like 14 or 15 or even younger than that. It was like Raiders of the Lost Ark was the movie I saw where it wasn't just that I was like, oh, I love this movie. It was more that I was like, oh, what is – how do people do this? Like, you know, that it's a constructed thing, you know, like it, it became, I became aware that it's like, Oh, people made it. It didn't just appear out of thin air. And so then I started getting really interested in film and then, you know, ultimately went to the Vancouver film school. Cause I was living just outside of uh, Vancouver, BC. So, um, and so Kevin and I both just sort of independently, end up getting in, we're in the same class. Uh, it was like the 25th, 26th, like they were, in, they were numbered. So the school had just opened and we both went because our grades weren't that good. And so it was like, this is a tech school, right? You just go, it's eight months, you're in and out. Kevin, um, so we arrived there together, we kind of become friends, but Kevin is the one who came with a plan. Like Kevin had already sort of, um, he was working in a convenience store, and the video store back and forth. And so he kind of went there with the intention of like, I'm going to learn how to make a movie and then go back and make the movie with my friends. And then we became friends. And so it became like um, around halfway through the program. It's like at the four month mark, it was like 10,000 all in. And I think at the halfway mark, it's like you had to put in your next 5,000. And Kevin was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go home and get my job back and you stay and finish the term out and learn how to <laughs> learn whatever's left to learn <laughs> as far as like all that was really left in the back half of the that um, four months was we switched into doing these sort of narrative 16 millimeter shorts. So you worked on like two, I think, or one, no, you just worked on one. Um, and, uh, and so Kevin left to save the money to put towards the movie. And then I stayed and that's when Dave, like Dave Klein was in our class, who was the cinematographer on Clerks. And he, um, we had kind of known each other, but as soon as Kevin left, like then Dave and I started hanging out a lot. And so by the time we graduated, so it was like March of 92, we start class, October we finish, um, and Dave and I are friends. And then after that, we started making like, there's all, there's a bunch of people, you know, there's like a community of like people who've gone to the school and they were making short films outside of the, the, the program. And so I was, I was editing one, I was the editor on one and, and I 
was the dolly grip during the shoot. And I was doing it. I was cutting it at night and Dave had shot it. And so we were all just kind of around, but Kevin, in the meantime, I remember working on that short when I was dolly, it was the dolly grip for whatever reason. And, um, that's when I read, uh, inconvenience or the first draft of clerks. So that was like probably November of 92. So we meet in March of 92 by November of 92. I have the, the draft for clerks. And then, and then from there we were going to shoot earlier, but then, um, there was a big flood and Kevin's like house was flooded and right. his car was flooded. And so he couldn't do it. <clears throat> and so we, um, we postponed it till March and then I was prepping in the morning to rent equipment. Like I was getting up like really early at like 5 AM to call houses in New York to rent camera equipment. And, and I, we had sort of talked to, you know, <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot of stories, but we had talked to, you know, we had talked to one DP who was in New York. He's an older guy who had his own pat lighting and et cetera, et cetera. And I remember Kevin and I was talking and like, this is totally, I mean, look, it all worked out. So, but I remember, I remember being like, I remember distinctly feeling like, oh man, like if there's that one guy who knows everything and we're just complete neophytes, it's like, it kind of, we, we both were a little bit like, it feels wrong, like, you know, or it feels like it just felt like the wrong mood to have this person who was always like, you can't do that. And you have to do this and you have to right. do that. I think we were just selfish and scared. <laughs> ignorance, uh, like, ignorance was bliss. Yeah, it, was, it truly was like kind of like, um, and then Dave uh, and we knew Dave and we we're like, well, let's have Dave, let, you know, let, let's, let's bring a lot of people who know nothing together. <laughs> so, I mean, on paper, this sounds fantastic as an investment. So we were talking of, it's, I mean, it really does. Black and yeah. white movie about clerks, no star power, cost about 20 something, 27,000 if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, first time DP really, I mean, other than shorts, first time director, first time producer, um, yeah. first time cast essentially. You had first no, time yeah. first time. Everything. So again, on paper, solid, solid yeah. investment. <laughs> Everyone lined up. Everyone's just like, how much money yeah. do you need? Yeah. They um, were like, they wanted to give us a million. And we we're like, no, 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 no. No, no. We stop. only want 27,000. <laughs> Uh, let's not yeah, get crazy yeah. and then and, and also i just re recently found out that dave uh dave was the dp on the mandalorian so he's done okay for himself <laughs> yeah i mean dave you know shot I mean, dave went on to sh shoot like most of the seasons of homeland and now he's on mandalorian like you know <laughs> yeah he's sort of you know his career in the last has just taken off, you know, and he's doing, you know, he's been nominated for Emmys, like, it's just amazing. But yeah, we were, at that point, you know, that's why Kevin ended up paying for it, you know, essentially all those on his credit cards. But, you know, his, his, his mindset, which always made sense to me, was like, you know, you can go to NYU, and if you'd have gone to NYU or another sort of more prestigious film school, it's like, you could have spent a hundred thousand, you know, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars. So it's like, you know, by the time he came out of Vancouver Film School, having spent like, you know, eight to ten thousand dollars in fees and living and et cetera, et cetera. And then you add, you know, another 30 grand in credit card debt. It's like it didn't seem, you know, it's like on paper, once again, like on paper, it was like, is this the worst thing? Like you, you guess you're in debt. And if the movie is a total disaster, you'll have to dig yourself out of it. But like. Why not just jump in? I mean, but that's that, and I, I will say this: like that's that's you know, that's not me. That was Kevin. Like Kevin had that. Kevin's always had that drop, you know, and like to to make that sort of like leap, you know, he made the leap of like, I'm just like fuck it, like I'm just gonna do it, you know, and like start racking, up, like giving credit cards. And, you know, it no, it's and it's. I mean, look. I, you know, I grew up in the '90s, uh, and and that and you you guys were part of that first wave of true independent. Like that, what uh, what we consider independent film today was created, starting in '89 with Sex Lies, and continued with Clerks and 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 El Mariachi and Reservoir and and that whole you know Linkletter and Slacker and all these guys, um, and, and 
when you guys were making Clerks, it hadn't really hit yet. Sundance was Sundance, but it wasn't Sundance. Like you guys helped create the mythos around Sundance with with Clerks and Mariachi, and then of course all these other films that came around that time. So there was there wasn't even kind of a blueprint for what you guys were doing. Like it wasn't like, oh yeah, we're going to submit to Sundance and then obviously Harvey and Miramax is going to pick this up and we're going to get a fat check and our careers are blown. Like that wasn't even a thing yet. So the risk that you guys were taking was not only crazy, looking in hindsight, like on paper, it looked horrible, but it was like really, it was really brave and stupid all at the same time. A hundred percent. But I will, I will sort of like, Unfortunately, punch a hole. <laughs> please punch, please punch away. Because uh, there was actually like an absolute blueprint, which was, was Slacker. It? You're right. I guess Slacker did. You're right. Slacker. So Slacker, but... Slacker comes out. Kevin sees Slacker. Like, here's the Slacker blueprint. Kevin goes to New York, sees Slacker, goes, it, lo- loves it. And he's like, if that's a movie, I can make a movie, right? <laughs> and then from there, there was like, you know, there was enough examples. I guess you're right. We were really Slacker. early, though. Slacker, be- we were super early, and we definitely became like part of the sort of Sundance mythos of like the ultra low budget kind of like film from nowhere, you know, and then filmmaker plucked out and sort of, <clears throat> you know, given a, a career. Like we we're definitely all part of that. But there was enough, you know, right down to the fact that Kevin was like. There was an article about Slacker that he had framed on his wall, which was Rick had made the movie and then showed it as a in-progress screening at the IFFM, which was the International Feature Film Market. And and Amy Taubin did this sort of wrap-up article every year of, and picked a few movies, and she had picked Slacker. And so that really was the blueprint. Sundance was technically not the end zone. The end zone was to get to IFFM and screen it. So we had that blueprint. And then there was another article I remember written by Peter Broderick, which was a, a, a um, budget breakdown of Laws of Gravity, which had yeah. received us very, very like by year, but it still was like, and so it kind of helped shape this idea of like, we think we can do this because I think Slacker was 22,000. And Laws of Gravity was around there too. So it was like, it kind of became this sort of like $25,000 idea. That was the budget, you know? And, and, and before, you know, the other person who was like very influential, who had preceded everybody was Jarmusch. Mm-hmm. You know, like he, Stranger Than Paradise was a huge influence. I mean, like a big influence as far as like, long takes, you know, like there was definitely an influence, but it was also just an influence of like, you know, being young and like the, the, those, those are the first independent films that I, like, I think Stranger in Paradise was like the first indie film. I really what was saw. that? What year was that? What year was that? Is that 89, 90? I thought it was 89. I was about to look. Yeah. I think I it's it, cause, cause I know, I mean, obviously Soderbergh's, you know, sex lies was, but that was a million dollar that was like a million dollar yeah. movie. That, was, that wasn't a small indie, but it was the thing that kind of launched Sundance into being what Sundance essentially became. Um, and prior to that, Hollywood Shuffle in 87, which was another big blueprint, which I think I think Robert Townsend doesn't get enough credit for, for being like one of the first guys. I think he was one of the first guys to put everything on his credit card and just say, screw it. And he- Yeah. yeah. And I, like, I think Kevin, like Kevin, the blueprint, I, I'm pretty, I think, that was that's why Kevin put it all on his credit card. It's like it was like the like the blueprint was sort of like Hollywood Shuffle, Slacker. Laws of Gravity was just the first budget I'd ever seen where they'd broken it down into camera equipment and all that stuff. And I was just like such a neophyte that I was like, it just gave me something where I was like, oh, like so if somebody says the camera package costs three times as much, I can cry bullshit and go like, no, 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 like this, you know what I mean? It just gave me something to, to base it on. But we did have this sort of, we had this blueprint and we ultimately go to the IFFM. We have a terrible screening and no one's in the, like there's, there's us in the cast and then there's like three or four other people, you know, but there was one guy, 
there's one guy, this guy, Robert Hawk, um, who is a consultant for Sundance and was a big part of the indie film world. And he had watched it and he becomes this sort of like, he leaves and he tells Peter Broderick and then Amy Taubman, who wrote the article, calls Peter Broderick and says, like, is there anything I missed? And he's like, you got to watch this movie, Clerks. So then Kevin's in the store. We're all depressed because we're like, well, that's it, right? Like, that's that's 40 grand. Like, <laughs> the blueprint was over. <laughs> the blueprint <laughs> ran out. We're like, we ran out. Done. Yeah, we turned the page and we're like, fuck, it's blank. There's nothing left to do except lick our wounds. And then Amy Taubman calls Kevin at the store and basically we become – we become the, the sort of if, if the slacker article she wrote is the prototype we basically become that film for that year we became the film you know we became the slacker of her article and then everything just sort of ballooned from there you know everything was just like and it was all look it's all <clears throat> so much of it was word of mouth because it was like from peter broderick amy talbot like it just became like Larry Kardish from MoMA and then John Pierce. Like it just, you know, then the film just starts, like then people are moving, advancing things without us doing anything. And we're just sitting back, you know, like, uh, like watching like, um, you know, roller coasters like, uh, like this. You're just like, what the fuck's happening? And you're so um, long for the ride at that point. Yeah. As soon as it, I mean, look, you know, as soon as we get to Sundance, you know, the, the only thing left is like, Will someone buy it? You know, we still didn't know that. And and there had been sort of screenings prior, so some of the studios had seen it. And it was really like, well, we gotta have a we have to have really great screenings to see it. So that was the only thing kind of left. And then once it's bought, then it then it's truly like the roller coaster of like, you know, but it was, it was really um, you know, it was it's something that <clears throat> The, the experience from beginning to end is was so incredible like it, it was it was like it was written you know like you, by the time you're like by the time we're in can in critics week and Kevin and I are like <laughs> trying to avoid going to the awards dinner because we didn't want to dress up or some stupid shit and then we go and we win you know, and we're just sort of like, there's, there's this amazing photo of us just sort of like, I mean, I, I think it's more on my back, but Kevin's face is just that like, what? That <laughs> holy shit moment of like, you know, because you constantly, you, you, in a way, you, you, your mind sort of adjusts to what happens. So you go like, okay, we got into can and now it's over. Like, okay, we got the Sundance and now, you know, so you kind of go like, all right, like, just can't keep going. Yeah, like the the amazing train has uh, okay, the amazing train stopped here. Okay, this is great, this is amazing, and then it's like it just kept going with that movie. Um, it just had such a life of its own, and it was such an amazing sort of. You know, we flew around the world. It was just, and we were tw I was twenty two, I think. <laughs> so it was such. It was incredible. It was it was like, you know, and for years it was like it has been. It it, it will always be. It will always be the most this incredibly special experience that nothing can really touch for reasons of like um, for reasons that aren't the fault of any other film I've ever worked on. It's just you know you can't you can't re-experience something for the first time. It's, it was, it's like it's like your first love. Like you you can't re-experience your first love you might not end up with that person or whatever but that moment and that time in your age and where you are in the world and your evolution and all that stuff you'll never ever get your first kiss like that's uh -oh. that's something you'll never get your first so clerks was essentially your first time <laughs> it, was, it was the first time and it was amazing it was like we were in can and i remember there was a miramax boat and then next to it was this was a, a yacht and Simon Le Bon was on it. And basically we were, you know, we were running around all the time, but basically we end up meeting Simon Le Bon and he's like, said, you know, he kind of says like, oh, I'd love to see a movie. And I was like, I was like, well, it's playing at like eight in the morning. 
or something crazy. And he's like, well, come get me. So I basically got up at 7.30, walked all the way to the, because we were staying at the hotel. And I walk onto his boat and no one's awake. So I wake, I rouse Simon Le Bon, who's like, and I take him to this and I walk him into a screening, you know? It was just and he's like, that's like, that's just, but that's like bizarro world kind of stuff. Like you can't even write that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It was just such an it was such an amazing experience. And there's been so many movies, uh, you know, there's lots of great experiences, but it was, you know, it was being that young, right? you know, and watching these doors open into a world. It's like, you can't, I mean, that's the thing, you know, you only walk through the door once. And that was like such an amazing experience of right. walking through the door into this sort of world that, you know, we generally are, are, um, you know, it's presented as, you know, behind a velvet rope, <laughs> so to speak. So it's like, you only kind of get to walk in there once. And that was, you know, that was clerks. Now, the one thing that I want everyone listening, and I think this is, a, this is a, this is an issue that I dealt with most of my filmmaking career. And I think a lot of filmmakers still do is they'll look at stories like clerks and slacker and mariachi and, and that kind of time period. And they will think they'll make films today thinking that that's an option. Meaning like what would happen to you? Like I always consider you guys like a lottery ticket. Like you guys won a lottery ticket. It was the right place, right time, right product. Um, and, and that goes along for all, like slacker and mariachi. Like, if you guys show up today with clerks, do you think you can cut through the noise? Um, I mean, it's, it's it's hard to say. What I what I will say is like something always cuts through the noise, right? Like there's right? always something that cuts through the noise, and and part of it is part of it is definitely luck and timing. You know, it's like part of it is luck and timing um, because. You know, as our career went on, like releases of movies is also about luck and timing, too. You know, it's like you can sort of make a great movie and it gets released at a bad time with a bad marketing campaign. And it doesn't sort of like <clears throat> I think could, you know, it's like it's a time right right now. Do I think that a film like Clerks? Well, it's like rated our comedy and, and all that's like. So much of that has grown since we've sort of come on the scene and there's so many actors in that in that world that I do think it would be harder to cut through because we what we were well and, and what Kevin was was like whether people think he's the voice of a generation or like I'm not arguing that point, but he was a voice from that generation that was unique and specific. And that's the thing that that's the thing that in addition to luck, you know, um, Oh, there's a combination. It's a formula. It's not just the one thing. It's a bunch yeah, of different things that hit to get same time. People who are, you know, people who are out there going like, you can't, if people who look at clerks or slacker, it's not like Kevin looked at slacker and was like, I'm going to make slacker. He more was like, Oh, that's a movie that like that that's a that's a vision from Rick Linklater. Like, you know, then Kevin was like, but this is what I find funny and this is what I enjoy doing. And he poured himself into that and had a unique voice. And you know, I'll always say this, which is, you know, Kevin had been writing for years and years and years and years since he was really young. So by the time he's 22 and writes a script, it's like, it's just fucking better than, you know, everyone who's 18 is like, I'm going to, now I'm going to write scripts. And then, you know, it's just because I read those, I wrote those. Like I wrote, you know, I'm trying to write a script, but holy shit, like this is, you know, because I had Kevin who was just a much more developed narrative writer. He's just kind of new and, and you could see it on the page. So I think there's a lot of, you know, Luck, luck is so many things, but, you know, the pursuit of a unique voice, right? Mm -hmm. The goal shouldn't be like, what do I have? You know, like, or it's like, let's just make a movie, like, let's make clerks in a, in a you know, a, like valets. Let's make valets. And it's like, you can go ahead, but unless being a valet is this very personal thing where you can convey something to the audience that that is unique then you just become like 
a knockoff movie, you know? And I think like, <clears throat> I think when people sit there and go like, Hey, let's make something cheap. It's like, well, make something cheap and personal. And those, that combination will, that, that combination at least has the chance to cut through the noise, right? Because you're doing something that's like, you have to, and some people's personal, what's personal to them and what means something to them can be a $30,000 movie. Or some people, it's like a 40, like, you know, sometimes the scale of that can be, some people like sci-fi, like, it doesn't really matter, but like, I do think finding your voice is, and I'll, I'll bring it back to me, which is like, that experience of finding your voice was a much longer process for me. And then like, I, you know, Kevin walked in the door at like 22 and like, he had been developing his voice for years though. Like he had been writing school plays and stuff like that, but finding your voice um, for me is the most important thing that you can do. Like, that's the thing that people, like finding your voice, finding that thing that's unique to you. Um, if you can look at something in a way that no one else is necessarily expressing, there's other people who see it the same way. And if you can capture that, that's how you gain an audience, right? Like we all look at things in different ways, but there's also just like, I think what clerks did, and this is like, not anything I thought about when I was 21. <laughs> but what I thought, what I think it did was it created this sort of, you know, it was an expression of something that didn't exist. And there was this huge audience that was like, it does exist. This is how I talk to my, like, like, this is what we think is funny. This is when we bullshit with our friends. Like, and that, that, that's the part where it's like, there's all kinds of luck that has to come into it. There's all kinds of timing. And we as filmmakers, like, I believe what you have to focus on first and foremost is like, what's the unique, what do you, what's, what's the unique sort of perspective that you're bringing to what you're doing? That's a, that's a great, great, great piece of advice. You're absolutely right. If you could connect with something that's authentic to you in your own voice, if you try to go make another Clerks, you're going to fail because there's, there's already a Clerks and it was done authentically by Kevin and you. Um, and yeah. yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. Now after Clerks, obviously you guys are the toast of the town. You know, you're the bell of the ball. You're, you're being wooed. It's the, it's the early nineties. Money is flying everywhere. And they say, what do you want to do next? And I and, and Kevin and you say, hey, let's do mall rats. And uh, and you're like, here's here's that those million dollars that you were talking about earlier. Now we'll accept your money. So you make mall rats, uh, which, by the way, I'm I'm actually a very big fan of mall rats. I actually saw it in the theater test screening in the theater when I was in college. Oh, wow. And I got I got that little book that the the the, 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 the movie official movie book. That yeah, yeah. I, they gave one to you as you walked out and stuff. I oh yeah, I, I saw. I was my, me and my friend were pissing ourselves when we saw it because it was speaking to us at that time in our lives. Yeah. Um, so Mallrats um, didn't live up to the financial expectations it of the bombed. studio. It, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't want to no. say it out loud. It no, bombed. No, no. It, it totally bombed. I mean, look, the wounds of Mallrats have been healed, you know, a long time oh. ago. Knowing that, like, the audience ultimately found that movie, and, mm -hmm. and you know, it didn't didn't. It wasn't 1990, you know, when it came out, it was like, it was pretty dark. We were both like, fuck, because you put all that work into it. But and, you're, you know, and you were also, and you guys were pretty much, so you guys were put in, because you you had one hit, which was Clerks, which was kind of like, all right, this is an anomaly. Let's see if these guys have anything else. So they give you a little bit of money and then Mall Rats happens and it bombs. So that pretty much blacklists you in town from my understanding like it, it kind of just you're in director jail and producer jail at this point it's the you know it's the sophomore slump that got the reviews were terrible you know a lot of it sort of like pointed right at kevin i think which was just like you know we built you up we we you know we really send you out and then you make this and you know i think in hindsight i would be curious if any if any critics would have the you know, to go back and re-look at that movie and, and understand its connection to Clerks, you know, like understand that it's not this sort of, and I think for you as an audience member, like you understood it, right? Like it felt like, <clears throat> like a, a proper extension of, of what that movie was. And, but we were, you know, 
at that point, Kevin had, at that point, before it was over, Kevin had started writing a version of Chasing Amy that was a little bit more commercial. And as soon as it happens, it's like, I guess we were in movie jail, but in a way we didn't even, we lived in Jersey. So it was like, it wasn't like, it wasn't like we we're in Jersey. It's like when you're not in Hollywood, it's like, you're not, it's like, you don't you really feel, know. You didn't feel the heat, if you will. Yeah. You didn't feel anything. We were just kind of like more bummed out and like, oh shit, what do we do now? And Kevin was like, you know, like, let's just go make another movie, you know, and let's do it quickly. And so Chasing Amy became a, a, a reaction to all that money, you know, that we were given and, and the fact that it didn't do well, we we're like, well, let's create something that we know we can get enough money. Um, and let's do it cheap and, and also do it our way. You know, we kind of went back to let's do it for enough money that we can be left alone and then really be specific about what we're doing and, and not worry about, you know, casting, like we can cast who we want. So let's do it for, you know, shot the whole thing, you know, ultimately. like a hundred grand, like a hundred grand or something like that. Right. It was like to shoot it and start cutting, you know, to deliver like a, 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 a sort of a couple cuts of the movie and, and get it far along. It was like a couple hundred grand. Um, so there, there's a post cost and all the rest of it, but we did it, you know, we kind of went in at a price point that was like, we knew that, it wasn't a huge investment for somebody. We could make our money back. You know, we were using like a great crew, you know, young people. And cause we were young too. I mean, we're, I think I was 26 at that point. Mm -hmm. um, young crew from New York, you know, was coming down, we were shooting all in Jersey. And then, you know, we were back to sort of a version of, of making clerks again, just with a, you know, we took the experiences from clerks. We took the experience from mall rats and sort of, Chasing Amy becomes the the rebuilding year. You know, it becomes like let's 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 sort of like we had we had other producers on Mallrats who we got along with, but it was like this is like all right, let's just do this our way. Like yes, we need a bigger crew. Yes, we need this. Yes, we need that. But like, how do we do that through through our filter and, and through the way we want to do things? And then from there, it's like. After Chasing Amy, that's where we carry on through Dogma and everything else. But it was a really like, it was a refocus. That whole movie was just sort of like a shift back to like, all right, this is what we're doing. And, what we're doing. And, uh, and the smart thing that you guys did is that you moved so quickly because Mall Rats was, you know, you guys, there was a lot of eyeballs on you in town. And they're like, oh, these guys, obviously, they're, they're, they're one hit wonder. You know, yeah. uh, that's it. They're bubble gum. Let's, it's, it's move on. But you guys, like, no, no, let's, let's get in there. And arguably, Chasing Amy, it's one of my favorite of the filmography of what you and Kevin have done. There's so much heart, so much uh, authenticity in that film. It's not nearly as silly as Mall Rats in in the crudeness of it, but there still is those elements. But there's yeah. so much more heart in in Chasing Amy. Like there's, it's deeper in in a way. Am I am I am I wrong on that? No, no. I mean, I think I think Chasing Amy becomes the sort of. Um, I think a lot of people react to it because it becomes the sort of the movie that sort of represents kind of more the totality of who Kevin is. Right. So it's like the crude humor, of course, is part of it. But it's like, you know, he's also a drama, you know, he's a dramatist. He's, a, you know, he's he, he's also somebody who's like has a big heart. And, you know, it's also a personal movie, you know, it's a, a, it's a personal movie for him. And I think that that sort of shifts, uh, you know, sort of Clarks and Marats and this becomes something where he's like, all right, I'm going to tell another personal story, which, you know, just happens to be more grounded in, you know, there's a lot more drama and real drama, right? So it's like sort of drama coming from, stemming from this specific situation. But I think it became like, and that was a year late. So Mallrats comes out in 95, 96, like February or something. We start shooting Chasing Amy in February or March. And then January 97, we're in Sundance, you know, and we were, and we're back, you know. We're, and we're back, baby. And we're, yeah. and we're back. And that, and that does gangbusters at the box office, especially for its budget. And 
launches this little known actor, really Ben Affleck, uh, which is his first starring role and yeah. and that that whole thing. So um, it was just an exciting time because I was I was following you guys, like I was following you and Robert and Quentin and all that you know that crew and and Richard and all those that crew. I would watch every damn thing you guys put out, and it was that weird time. And, and, and I always tell people this, like the '90s, it felt like every month there was a new Cinderella story. It's either John Singleton, it's it's Ed Burns, it's it's uh, Kevin Smith. It was like a, it's just it was an amazing time to be an independent filmmaker. It was kind of like when um, when Spielberg and Lucas and Milius and and uh, Coppola and De Palma, th- that that film school brats generation when they were yeah. kind of given the keys to Hollywood because Hollywood had no idea what the hell to do. So they like here, go make Taxi Driver, <laughs> go yeah. make. And you guys kind of had that run in the '90s. It was that. From like 89 to like 98, 99, there was that run that was just so many amazing filmmakers came out during that time. I mean, I think there's, you know, I'm sure someone's read a a book about it, but I feel like, you know, part of it is like the industry sort of needs to open, you know, sort of like, especially then it's like nowadays it feels like there's a lot of venues and ways to get things made. And, And back then it was like, it was just harder to get things made because there weren't as many outlets. Um, but you also see the surge of, you know, Fox Searchlight. So there's more sort of like, there's more outlets for these movies. There's more opportunities. But also it felt like the, you know, like in the 70s, the business was kind of like, how do we fucking, how do we make, make money? <laughs> yeah, like what do audiences want? Like, you know, I, there's also a generational thing to me, which is like, the industry has to open its doors every once in a while to let in the new generation of voices that they don't necessarily understand. You know, like what was happening in the seventies, it's like, it's not like those guys who were making movies in the fifties and sixties necessarily understood like that the audience wanted to see easy rider. Right. Like right. easy rider kind of opened the door for all those guys. So like, listen, wait a minute, this 200 and something thousand dollar movie went on and made like, you know, $10 million or whatever it made. They were just like, we don't know what the hell's going on. Let's give it to these guys, the Scorsese and the Spielberg kid. Let's give them that shark movie. <laughs> yeah, it's like it, it just became a. It, it's like audiences change. I, you know, I think it's always like some combination of, you know, audiences are changing and and you know younger people come up and I, it's happening now. Like, like there's you know I'm almost fifty, so it's not like I'm the young buck anymore. And there's a whole generation of people coming up that have been influenced by totally different people. And, you know, they all had the internet <laughs> since they were born. Like all of these influences change what people, people's taste. So it's like, I, you know, and I think in the nineties, there was a sense of like um, coming out of the eighties, it was like this need of like fresh voices and, you know, something that was more reflective of, of that, of the generation coming up. The Gen X, the Gen X guys, you know, uh, we're, yeah. we're, we're Gen X guys. We're the, we're yeah. the that generation was like, I just, yeah, it was the nineties were fun, man. The nineties were yeah. fun. I mean, I miss, I miss them more now than ever before <laughs> when you could just go to a movie theater. That was nice. Yeah. Well, that was, last, that was like the last year. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And I had to go all the way back to the nineties, but yeah, the nineties were, we had a lot, you know, I had a lot of fun in the nineties. It's funny. No one ever talks about the two thousands. You know, the, like you never hear like, oh, the two thousands music. Like, no, you know, I and and I know those songs and I know that and I know those films, but it, the eighties and nineties get in the seventies, eighties and nineties kind of get that they have their own thing, but the two thousands is tough and like the two thousand tens was another. <laughs> but is it just that it's too young? I don't know. Oh no, don't worry, it'll come back around. Like right now, we're in our nineties nostalgia, and I think now people are starting to kick into the early two thousands. It's like a two decade. Run because eight. Remember when the eighties was like all the rage, like everything was eighties, 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 and eighties yeah. is still eighties is still cool to a certain extent. But I remember when it was seventies, like in the nineties, the seventies were kind of like a thing, and it, there's like a two to three decade delay. <laughs> well, I think we're old enough where it's like at a certain point, like we're not nostalgic. I like part of it is because like we have we you and I will probably never have nostalgia for the two thousands, right? Because we were just too old, right. like. Like once you hit 30 or whatever, it feels like you sort of cease being, you know, it's like you stop like 
living in this, you, or you stop reflecting back in nostalgic terms. Like You're right. the 80s, I was going, like I graduated from high school in 89. So the 80s was like when, you know, the movies and music, you're, you're, you're sort of, what I think is like the 80s for me, the 80s and 90s was an explosion of in, like I'm ingesting massive amounts of, of art in the form of movies, music, photography, like everything. Like the 80s and 90s, like I would fucking watch like four movies. Like when I was in, I would watch four movies a day. Yep. Like I, like it's this massive period where you're taking things in partly because, you know, you're not great or you have an outlet to, to like put things out. So you're sort of like, you're amassing all this stuff. And so I think that's why it has such a strong influence mm-hmm. on who we are. Like I think back to the eighties and nineties and yeah, like I, like everything I do today, it's like, it feels a little bit referential to that time. But part of it is because like, that is when the synapses were really forming around like, and these sort of large touchstones like land in your head during that period. And then by the time we get to 2000, like I don't have all these sort of cultural touchstones of like, you know, I was, of course I was listening to music and watching movies. I was doing all that stuff. And there's great movies from that period and great music and all that stuff. But it's still like, it doesn't have the same sheen to it because it wasn't during that sort of explosive period of like, you know, getting your driver's license and kissing like everything's new you know what I mean? <laughs> no, you're absolutely you're absolutely right you're absolutely right now there's a couple of there's a few films that you produced that i had i mean i'd heard of a couple of them but i didn't when i started doing research i actually went into it and there was a, a group of four features that you produce vulgar uh drawing flies a better place and the big helium dog yes. um, I, I you know i've seen some of big helium dog it which yeah. was shot on like VHS? I'd like out of beta? Like what was that shot? <laughs> I think they were all shot on 16 millimeter. Really? Yeah. They were all shot? Because it, I guess the copy that I saw was so bad yeah. that yes. it looked like you shot it on video. I'm like, why did they shoot this on video? This makes no sense. But yeah. the other ones were shot on 16. So, uh, you know, some of the people in that, like you had the Broken Lizard guys, you had uh, Q from Impractical Jokers and Baba Booey, Brian Lynch, um, all this, these amazing people. Tell us, can you tell me just a little bit about those four movies? And because they were kind of in a small, they were in a short period of time that yeah. they were all made. It was after, I think it was after Chasing Amy, and we had sort of signed a deal with Miramax, like an overall deal. And part of what we threw in was like, hey, we want to make these micro budget movies, it, it, sort of in a way to sort of like. Our career was sort of the movies were getting bigger, you know, the budgets were getting bigger. And we were like, well, hey, let's sort of with some of the people we know that that have scripts that 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 they're writing and stuff like let's go make some of these micro budget things in the 20, 25 range, basically clerk budget. I feel like we got 100 grand to make four movies and we sort of and then the the relationships was, um, you know, Brian Lynch. Um, had worked on Chasing Amy. Um, Vincent Pereira had been around since Clerks, who directed A Better Place. And then vulgar Brian Johnson was Kevin's friend for a long time. Um, So all these movies just became an extension of that moment. We were like, oh, well, let's go sort of make some of these movies. And, you know, and... And it did. It happened within like a two or I think it was like two or three year period, you know, and, and the and Brian was the one who knew the Broken Lizard guys and or, you know, he kind of had connections to them. And Brian Quinn had just worked at the office. So mm-hmm. <laughs> like he had worked even more. <laughs> I, I was talking to him the other day, like I'm, we've known each other for like 25 years. He had sort of come in to work at the office like he was in charge of like. Back in 19, uh, you know, 99, if you got a T-shirt sent in the mail, it was Brian Quinn who did it. You know, like that's where he was. And he so was, he, was working know, at, he was working at VSQ. Yeah, he was working at VSQ at that time. And so all the people we kind of knew and it was like, you know, we loved independent film. And so we were like, let's go make some of these movies. And they're all very different, you know, and Vulgar got into Toronto and 
they all had various degrees of success. And, um, and then, and then I think it was like my memory of like, why didn't we keep doing it was, it was a lot of, <laughs> it was a lot of like, there's almost too much work. Um, like <laughs> I mean, not, making a, making a movie is not, it's not yeah, easy. I mean, look, we weren't, it's not like we were on set all the time. And, and I think it was just a matter of like, we made dogma, so we're heading into Dogma and then the Clerks cartoons happening and it's just like the, the amount of work we're doing is expanding and then suddenly like to maintain those or to keep them going just right. felt too much work. But it was really fun, you know? And now, is, is it true that there is just no copies of Big Helium Dog anywhere? I mean, Brian Lynch has one. But no, but I, I just saw an interview say, but he doesn't have one. <laughs> he said it didn't uh, have it. <laughs> I'll ask him, but as far as I know, he, he I, has a I, copy of it, but it's not been released, okay. but it's not available. It's anymore. never been released. And I can't remember why there was some clearance issue, um, but it was never released. Now the rest it's of a, them were, it has a hell of yeah. a cast. It has a hell of a cast. <laughs> now, I don't know what happened to it. It was like, it was off and on through the years. It was like music clearances or there was something that was sort of um, hanging over its head. And it just, it just never sort of, I thought it, he he must have a copy. Somewhere. I have to believe. I mean, he's the director. Yeah. He's got to have at least a yeah. VHS copy of it. Or now it's like fucking Raiders of the Lost Ark to find the thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It might be. I'm sure, like, or View Askew or somewhere, there's got to be a copy. I do not have a copy. So one know. day it will get. One day it will get uh, <laughs> leaked on 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 online, just yeah. like uh, Deadpool <laughs> did accidentally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Now you you uh, you also got involved with another little known film as a producer uh, called Goodwill Hunting, and that was um, uh, you know one of my favorite films of that of that time period. And how did you get involved with that? And and how did you like kind of was it Ben that brought you in on that? So we were um, on Mallrats. We met Ben, um, and at that time. We were aware of who he was because, like, the whole um, saga of, of Good Will Hunting was in the trades where they had sold, like, Ben and Matt had sold the script to Castle Rock um, for a bunch of money. So it's like, you know, other young guys, like, sell script for a lot of money. And so it was on our radar. And then through Mallrats, we became friends. And... My memory is that like during that period, we met Matt during a like a, a sort of internal screening on Mallrats. But basically what we found out is that that Castle Rock was gonna put it into turnaround because the guys are attached, but they wanted to attach a director that the guys weren't excited about. So basically there was like a and so there was like a, a big turnaround cost and they sent us the script and we really loved it. And we had just signed our overall deal at Miramax. And so we sent it to our executive, John Gordon, and we we're like, this is fucking great. You guys should make this. Like, we, you know, like, you should meet with the guys. There's a turnaround cost, but you guys should act fast and dive all over it. And so it happened really quickly. And that's, you know, our job, we really were just like, we had just signed a deal. So we became a sort of conduit to get it there. Mm -hmm. hype it up and get everybody excited and then it happened really quickly so by the time by the time chasing amy happens all of that was done like basically the movie was at uh the movie was at was at miramax and they were writing doing rewrites and they were also like like i remember like meeting with directors you know there was like before like they wanted gus to do it because um they had met Gus, and Gus wanted to do it, but then it was like Michael Mann and a couple other directors. That would have that would have been an int Michael Mann's Goodwill Hunting would have been a very interesting. There might have been a couple more guns, just a couple. There, there would have been like all. There would have just been all guns. But um, yeah, there would have been yeah. a shootout with Will Hunting, yeah. which is that love that great sequel, <laughs> Goodwill Hunting Two: Hunting Season yeah, from, yeah. from Jade Silent Bob Strikes Back. What a great Michael Mann version in a totally different way, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was, and then we, you know, sort of, and then once it's in the hands of Gus Van Sant, it's like, you're sort of just, you know, then you just get to be a fly on the wall. So we were up there a couple of times, we were shooting in Toronto, and um, it was just, you know, it was really interesting. I mean, for me, it was really interesting to watch because you're working so much, you're not on this, you know, you don't go on the sets of other filmmakers, and it's sort of interesting to watch how 
people act in different ways. Like he's very quiet and sort of, you know, he's not sort of sitting at the monitor shouting, like he sort of directs in this more sort of quiet way. Um, yeah, I mean, that film was like, I remember seeing the, we went into New York to see like the, the director's cut or whatever. And it was like, I mean, yeah, like it was basically 90, 95% of what the movie ended up being. Like it was just so like, he just knew what he wanted it to be. And it was so specific and like, it was just incredible. Like I remember just being, you know, you had chills. You're just like, wow. Like so, so good. Man. That movie's just so, 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 yeah. so, so, so good. Yeah. Um, now during this time, uh, I think you were heading into dogma. Did you, did you guys know that this was going to be as controversial as it essentially became? Um, we knew in the sense that, you know, at that point, Miramax was owned by Disney and Disney was like, you know, we're not going to let you make this movie. So it's like, it wasn't like we kind of entered into it. The, the writing was on the wall a little bit from the very beginning. That, like there was a real like problem. Uh, that there was a problem. And then um, it sort of, it, you know, it kind of grew from there and then kind of like, you know, peaked at a certain point and didn't kind of get worse or, or didn't get better or worse. It just sort of, you know, there was pickets at the New York Film Festival and, and pickets when the movie, you know, picketing or, or um, when the when the movie came out. But um, yeah, I actually remember seeing Kevin going out to picket with them. And like, who's this bastard who made this movie? It was brilliant yeah. to watch. Yeah. yeah, he went out and he protested. <laughs> he protested his own film. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, but but yeah, it was uh, it was. Um, we we kind of knew enough to you know we had a fake name for the movie while we were making it and you know nothing really came of it but there was there was definitely like a tension about it before um early on and it was i mean look was it a surprise to us like we were like what's the big deal yeah but enough people at that point were like you got to take it more seriously and so but, you're, pl you know, you're playing with fire. You're playing with fire, yeah, guys. Just yeah. be just, just be aware of what's going on. Don't be completely ignorant of what's I happening. Imagine, I mean, part of me is just like, it never really got that bad. And I couldn't imagine if, you know, today. Oh, my like, God. Can you imagine like, if Dogma today, showed up today? Like, I think that just, you know, partly with social media and all the rest of it, it would just be, I mean, that's part of the thing, too, where it's like even a protest has to like be ignited, right? It needs fuel. And I think like it was still 1998 and it's like, there just wasn't the, you know, it was still just like people, in, like 10 people in front of a movie theater and everyone's just driving home going like, oh, whatever, fuck. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Could, yeah. Imagine Facebook around that time or Twitter or something like that would have exploded. Uh, it would, it would certainly, they, fewer people, I mean, the key is like a few people can make a lot of noise now. And, you know, and I think back then it was way harder to do. So it's just sort of the momentum of what happened around the release. It just kind of was like, it just, it was kind of gone very quickly. Now, another film that you produced, uh, Jersey Curl, was unlike anything I'd ever seen in the sense of the attention that you guys were getting, like, while the movie was being made because of Ben and... Ben and Jennifer's relationship, or Benifer, as they like to call it. I mean, the pressure of you guys as the filmmakers must have been like, dude, I just want to make a movie. And it all of a sudden turns into this thing that it's not even about. Like, it's about Jennifer. And we got to cut Jennifer out of it now because she had this thing with Julie, with Julie or the other thing that they. So, like, yeah. you got you got caught up in this kind of tsunami <clears throat> that was not even your fault or even initiated by you you guys got just caught up in the the banner for tsunami how do you deal with that being like in the center of a hurricane like that with that when you kevin were dealing with that um you know you i mean ultimately like with everything in life it's like you get to a point where you're just like well there's nothing we can do about it it's like <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it, it right. like the you know at the time when we started the movie it's like their relationship just started. So on one level, there's, you're like, well, this could be great for the movie, right? Like there's no, you, you don't know either way. And then when it, and then by the time we get to the test screening, it's just obviously not going to be beneficial to the movie because people had such a strong opinion of the two of them that it, 
you know, transferred onto the movie itself. And then it was kind of after the first test screening where we're like, well, there's nothing we can do. You know, it's like, there's really nothing we can do. It's like the audience is, is not going to be enamored with this. And, and so like, it did become about trying to, and look, you don't want to be in that situation. You know, you don't want to be sort of fueled by, or be making creative decisions based on just sort of like a negative response that your audience has, has to the actual individuals and not the characters. But you also, you know, there's nothing you can do. It's like once you're sitting in it, and it was it was enough. It wasn't like there was two people. It wasn't like there was like a couple that like were like, we fucking hate those guys. It was like like it was palpable. You're like, all right. <laughs> it, yeah. Like we can keep testing this thing. And it's it like, wasn't like, no, there was gonna be a whole other audience. It was like, we love them and we hate them. It wasn't even like it was just like generally people were like, we don't want to necessarily watch this. And so you know, you try to pivot off of that and, and try to maintain, you know, the story you want to tell as best as possible. But, but you know, ultimately it's going on in the theater. Ultimately an audience is going to, and if it's, if it's keeping the audience, unfortunately it's like, you know, it's not what the movie's about. So you're like, right. if it's keeping the audience from sort of interacting with or, or sort of being receptive to, you know, what the heart of the movie is, then, you know, you have to make that decision of, like, start to trim that part of the movie down and, and get into the sort of the rest of it. And so it was it was definitely frustrating. But, you know, I, I tend to believe, like, you know, the energy you spend, the energy you spend battling things you just have no control over is just, you know, a lot of wasted energy. And the, is that, it? Well, is that... that that is a that, that is that is the words of an almost fifty year old man saying that, and I completely understand what you're saying because things I there's just stuff when you just can't get until you hit a certain age or experiences well, in your life. Well, what it, it's like there's that great saying of like worrying is paying debt on money you don't owe. That's a great line. Great line. Yeah. yeah. And and that's sort of, you know it's like and, and you can apply that to like worrying about things that you have absolutely no control over is paying debt on money you don't owe. Like you're sort of, you're just grinding in this sort of thing. And look, we were younger back then. So I can probably impart these ideas because like <laughs> you go through enough experiences where you're like, oh wow, like, there, there really was nothing we could do. Like that that component of the movie was this exterior issue right. that existed outside of us. We couldn't reach into it and like, we couldn't recut their public persona right like, it, that, that was that that was the thing about it is because a lot of times when there's controversy in the film like dogma was generated by you guys like that's just the nature of the story and there yeah. was a there was a you know controversy and all of that stuff and even um zach and and mary make a porno that had some controversy too because it had the word porno in it like it freaked people out uh yeah. and they, but again generated by you guys but this was out of your control like it was completely exterior and i think also people were just so exhausted of seeing those two on together which is like we don't want to see a movie with these two now like it was just so much and you guys just got caught up in that wake yeah i mean look there's there's for every look hollywood you know couples in Hollywood, getting together, making movies, has gone has has been an incredible publicity benefit, and it's been a bad one. And it's like it it's not like it's not like we came to that moment. If if we'd all come to that moment, and they were like, every time two stars are in a movie together like this, it's a disaster. Then obviously there would have been enough people in the room going like, don't do it. <laughs> But it wasn't that. It was like there's cases in both sides. It's like it could either be a boon or it could be bad. It's like it could be Mr. Know. It could be Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you know, with yeah, exactly. which was exactly the same kind of Brangelina and that whole thing. And it was, but it fed it. It fed that movie. And this one, it just sucked and 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 hurt the movie. It was well, just really weird. To a place, and by the time the movie comes out, it's like there hasn't been a sort of turn. But basically, from the time we started. Moving on, it's like you know, you know the the public is is fickle and they'll <laughs> sort of change their mind, and so they change their mind and like, and you sort of sit in the test screen and go like, all right, 
you know, like, what are we going to, like, there's nothing we can do. We can be mad at, like, it was hard. You couldn't really focus your ire on anybody either. I mean, you could try, but once again, it was like, it was just that situation. Is Don Quixote essentially hitting the windmill at that point? You're like, there's nothing you can do. You there's nothing gotta... we could do. You, like I said, we couldn't, if, if we had the ability to, to go in and reshape the public persona to make it all good again, we could have done that and kept the movie the way it is, but that's, we had no, we couldn't do that. The only thing we could control is, is the content in the movie sort of, um, you know, trim back their sort of relationship at the beginning of the movie. And, and but, it was, get to the, but it ages well. Like you watch that movie now, it's aged yeah. very, very well because you're so far removed from that ridiculousness that now the movie can live on its own. So it's, I was just, so just always curious about that. And the movie is ultimately about him and his daughter. You know, it's about right. him and his daughter. That's what the movie is about. And 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 so you know, it ultimately, <clears throat> like you said, it sort of. I don't necessarily. I think there's probably a, a. I don't think even trimming back some of the beginning stuff was the end of the world. I think there's probably like a, a another version of the movie that's more of like a you know maybe a slightly extended opening, maybe putting some of the stuff back in there. But I think overall, it's like. You know, it it um it didn't it didn't it didn't sort of break the movie. Let's put it that way. Exactly, exactly. Now, you know, we've been talking all about you producing and and making you know Vioskew kind of films and all that kind of stuff, but then out of left field, <laughs> almost, uh, I start seeing that you're writing Freebirds and getting involved with that, and then directing The Grinch, co-directing The Grinch, and how the hell did you get into animation? And like, how did that work around town when you walked in? Like, I think you were saying like, aren't you the clerks guy? Like, why are you in animation yeah. now? <laughs> yeah. I, um, you know, I'd, I'd always want to, I remember I, I was going to go to art school or film school. So, so the sort of, I was all, I always was doodling and drawing and, and I, I was really like before I, I was really debating whether to go to art school or film school right at the moment that I ended up making a decision to go to Vancouver film school and meet Kevin. Like it's that fast. And, and I didn't know what to do. And I'll, I'll, I, I was living near UCLA. Um, I, I could, my grades weren't good enough to go there, but I was living in these sort of like shitty apartments there. And I used to run around the campus. Like I would do two or three runs around the entire campus. And then sometimes I cut through the middle and there were these big stairs where they shot gotcha. Like mm -hmm. there were these big stairs right in the middle of the thing. And I would run up the stairs and I was running and I was like, what am I going to do? And I run up the stairs and it was nighttime. I'd run at night after I was working and, I get to the top of the stairs and there's really bright light in my face. And so I kind of like slow down and adjust and they were shooting a movie. And I was like, I was like, that was it. Like, I was like, wow. you know, I was, my, my decision was sort of made in that moment. And then basically I very quickly applied to the Vancouver film school and four or five, five months later from that moment, I'm up in Vancouver and I meet Kevin. Like after that sort of moment, but but the art part, you know, the art thing was always in my head. So, in other words, if a if an animation cell would have fell out of a window and hit you in the head, we you might have never gone on that yeah, on that ride. There's a life drawing class up there. I'd have been like, oh my god, like I this is what I should this do. This is a sign. It's a yeah. sign. <laughs> and so I go to film, but I'd always been interested in it, and I'm you know, I've always loved animation, and but. The big moment was I remember Kevin and I, uh, because of Jason Lee, got to see The Incredibles before it came out, and yeah. it was like, and it was uh, a special screening. And you know, I, I I loved animation, and you know, I thought that Toy Story, and I'd already sort of like I was really interested in this sort of new technology applied to this sort of classical two um, Ds, and so. I saw that screening though, and that was the thing where I was like, oh, I want to do, like, I'd really love to do this because it felt like, oh, this is a movie. Like, it really felt like a movie. It was like, it's an animated movie, but the can't, you know, the camera work, the performances, like, it just felt like, oh, you, you could just make a movie. Like, you could do, 
what crane shot, like you could do whatever you wanted. Like you had all the filmmaking tools inside of this box, you know? And, and from there, and I remember telling Kevin, like, I think I left there and I was like, I want to do that. Like, I want to, I want to get under the hood of that and sort of do it. And, and so coming off of Zach and Mary, it was kind of the moment where I was like, I was like, if I'm going to do it, I got to, like, I got to, you know, I just got to do it. Like I got to sort of stop. I could do this forever. This is comfortable. And, you know, but for me, I'm, I was like, I just have to stop and sort of, you know, rebuild myself, like re refocus myself specifically on animation and, 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 and writing too. And like, I sort of, I stopped after Zach and Miriam and was just kind of like focusing on writing and trying to get into animation. And that's when, um, this guy, Aaron Warner, I knew, and then it just, be, and, and then it becomes like, you're in the business long enough and you know enough people. And if you've sort of, right. if you've, if you're, if you're fun to work, if you're good to work with, if you work hard, like, you know, all that stuff can pay off. I, I, I'll say that, which is Freebirds becomes this guy, Aaron Warner, who produced all the Shreks was like, I have this movie Freebirds. It was called turkeys at the time. And he was like, you know, if you want to, if you want to learn animation, like these things like a fast moving train. And if you're willing to sort of like jump onto it, um, you'll learn very quickly. And so I was like, as the producer and I was like, yeah, I was like, this is my shot, you know? Cause at that point it's like now, now it's like animated animation, making animated films is a much broader sort of, um, there's more opportunities, but at that point it was like, you know, this is at the, te this is the beginning of everything opening up. But at that, you know, that was more like Pixar and blues. Like there was these established studios. And if you had an idea, you had to go to those specific places and that was it. Um, so then I jumped on Freebirds and just through the process of making it, you know, it's a, it's a very open collaborative sort of medium it's a little you know it's a little bit different from making live action because it's just the pace of it's different it's just a much more open forum you know you're sort of making it a, you every you're getting together with a bunch of artists coming up with ideas and, and so i started writing pages and those are getting you know brought in and, and so then i come off of that i come off of Freebirds and i don't want to do animation <laughs> I, was like, I was like i don't know if i want to do animation and so because I was tired, it was a it was a tough it was just tough. Yeah, because you produced and wrote as well. Yeah, it was a tough schedule, and um, so I came off. And I was like, I'm not sure. I was like, I loved a lot of it and the people I worked with, but I was like, I'm not sure if I want to do it. And then, and then I was just working as an editor, you know, which I've done through the years, and I um, I cut a documentary on Marvel that was on ABC called From Pulp to Pop. Mm -hmm. It was like, so I did that and, and then I was cutting, a, I'd taken over or I was finished. I was just doing a polish, a little polish. I wasn't the main editor. I was just there for the end of a movie called, it ultimately became called No Escape, but it was called The Coup with Owen Wilson and Pierce Brosnan. It's by the Dowdle Brothers, the Dowdle, Bro Dowdle Brothers, mm -hmm. who just did the Waco series and like I had known them and, um, my friend was the editor and I was like, Oh, I'll get on that. And we were, and then that's when I got emailed by, from, uh, Chris Melendondri emailed me and I didn't know him. And I was like, well, I don't understand why I'm getting an email from him. But once again, so Brian Lynch, um, who was the craft service guy on chasing Amy and done all these <laughs> other things, you know, he wrote minions and, um, but he had wrote hop. So he'd been working in illumination for a while and he had given me, uh, or he had given Chris my information and Chris was like, Hey, cause illumination at that point was like, they were making more movies. And so it was like, as opposed to one, every two or three years, they were trying to do, you know, two a year, like they were just, and he was feeling like maybe I'll bring in for the first time, like a producer like an independent producer to help me sort of manage projects. And once again, I was like, I oh, don't know, I'm not sure if I want to do animation. And the Dowdle brothers are just like, the edit room that we're in was like a block and a half from Chris's office. And they were like, 
They were like, dude, like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> go walk down the block. And I was like, all right. So I went, and then Chris and I hit it off really well. And um, we met three or four times. And then before, we met a couple times before the Grinch came up. And then he showed me some artwork. It had been going on at that point for six, seven months or whatever. And, um, and so we went back and forth. And then finally, I was like, yeah, yeah, like I was, I kind of, I really got along with him well. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. So then that, that, so that happens. It's so funny because when you talk, as you're talking, a lot of, a lot of filmmakers listening, a lot of times they think, oh, well, it's about, it's about the agent or it's about the manager or about, you know, this or that. And it's just, it's about relationships. I mean, seriously, the craft service guy who, if you would have been a dick to, Yes, would have never recommended you for that job um, because you never know where anyone's going to be. And I've, I've had that happen to me in my career where they were my interns and then they all go off and are directing movies and, 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 and have you know all these this amazing career. It's so remarkable that just the craft service guy, what is it, 15 years later, 20 years later? <laughs> something like it's like that. 24 or five years <laughs> later. And I had kept in touch with Brian. Like, sure, uh, sure. Like, you know, we'd read, he'd send me scripts and I'd read them and we kept in touch and, but yeah, that was, you know, that it's was about the, relationships. Yeah. That was the seed of it of like, that someone like Chris was like knew Brian and was like, trust his opinion. And then he's like, who do you know that might be good about? And I had come off of Freebird, So I ultimately had some experience at that. Right. So I was like, I had some experience. And so, and I was even honest with Chris. Where I was like, I was like, I honestly don't know if I want to do animation. <laughs> <laughs> so like, worst, worst really, job interview ever <laughs> oh i was really like i don't know if i want to get into this but like i said i really kind of got on with him and then you know when he finally brought up the grinch i was and I, look when he brought up the grinch i was torn too because you know i love the chuck jones version mm -hmm. um i grew up with that and so i was like oh man like I don't know if I want to be the guy to fuck this. <laughs> I don't want to be the guy that screws up the Grinch. <laughs> yeah. Like I was like, if it was just the book, it's like, at least you're like, Oh, you know, like he didn't do a good adaptation, but it was like, there's, there was a lot of things for it. There's, there's the beloved Chuck Jones classic, which was, was in me too. But, you know, then I was like, but it's a really cool opportunity to sort of, build out a, a different version of it and and also you know build a a bigger world you know that was like part of what we were doing is like oh we get to really explore whoville and really expand on it and make this sort of a more expansive um experiential movie of, of it so and it did and it did okay at the box office it did okay it did. It ultimately did well. Yeah, About half a half a billion according to IMDb Pro. So, not yeah. not bad for a job you didn't want. <laughs> you know, I, the, you know the credit goes to so many people. I sure. Mean, that's sure. What's so much fun with animation is it's like there's so many incredible artists from you know layout to you know animators to you know the sort of concept artists and art directors and the vocal talent. Like, there's so many people. That's the greatest thing of animation is like, you know, it's like you spend years and years and years. And just when you're like about to shoot yourself going like, if I have to fucking look at another storyboard, you know, <laughs> it's like, it, then you start to see like, uh, then it's like right when you're there, it's like you start animating. And then right when you're sort of like going like, oh, they start lighting and rendering and like, it's like right when you're sort of getting tired and, and you know, like, when do we get to see the final? And, you know, right when you're right. just sort of desperate to see final images, uh, they always seem to pop up. And you go like, oh, OK, this is why we're doing it. Because it's like it does just look incredible. It's like when you get to sit in dailies and see the finished stuff, you're just like, it's just so amazing. You know? That's, but it, it's, it's like a, it's a pain. You have to be patient. It no, it's and now it's a system. I mean, when they were coming up, you know, when when Disney Animation was kind of setting it all up, it, they didn't even know what they were doing. But like now, it's there's a system. And I have a, a good buddy of mine that worked at Disney for twelve years as an animator. Um, he did he did uh, environments. 
he was a, a, a lead in environments. And I would go into Disney Animation and I'd walk around and I'd see the different departments and I'm just like in awe. It's just in awe of what you could do. And as a director, because I, I, I know that they did this at Disney Animation, is they would have a board up and they would give the directors a stack of cash, of like paper cash. And they would have all the sequences of the movie up. And they go, you can put money on what sequences you want to spend a little extra money on but this is all the money you get so they would get to choose like this action sequence i want a lot more more attention to as opposed to just let's kind of kind of get it through and is, does anything like that happen with that was just a disney thing that definitely did not happen because i would have just walked out with the money <laughs> you're like i'm okay. done i'm out yeah I'm going to put it in my pocket. And, it was fake. Know. Scott, it was fake money. It was fake. Yeah, we but. could talk about this later, but I'm going to take my wife out too much. Um, <laughs> no, we didn't do that. I mean, you know, it's something that, but that, the, that those conversations are sort of collective. Right. You know, you're, you're sort of, and you know, I mean, to me, it's just something you inherently know, whether it's a live action movie or a, or a, right. Or a animated movie. You're, you, you're sitting there going like, Hey, we have limited resources. We have limited money. We have limited time. So it's like, you know, you, you know, and in animation too, there's that sense of like, well, if you want this sequence to be freaking huge, then you better get going now, right? Because there's a pipeline. There's a moment where it's like with the movie, it's just like it's cut off. It's like you can't add new shots. You can't. They won't make it through in time. So, you know, there's a lot of thought constantly put into it of going like, oh, this is, you know, we want to do a big shot here. Like we were doing some. There's a big, huge, like, kind of drone crane shot in Grinch where we're, like, going through this pond of people skating and then all the way up to the, like, so you have to sort of, like, get all that stuff arranged because all the, you know, it's, it's, it's basically live action. You know, you have to sort of make sure that you've made those decisions to be like, oh, we want to set the tone here and want to do that here. Um, and part of that is has more to do with just like making movies with financial limitations, you know, right. which is most people. I mean, there are people who don't, you know, there's, there are filmmakers who are given the sort of do whatever they want. And I don't necessarily like, <clears throat> I mean, nobody's offered me that. I don't yeah. think it's never, well. These are not problems so, uh, you or I have. <laughs> Yeah, this is not a problem that I have, and I don't think it's a problem that I'll face. But I do think the limitation is th – those limitations can be really, really – it helps you – for me, it just helps you focus on the story. Right. And go like, hey, like, you better know what's important, you know, or you better figure it the fuck out really quickly because you are in charge of, like, trying to argue why people should – you know, we need more assets. We need this. We need that. If you're the person who's going to be driving and pushing for things, like, it, you know, the limitations will help you figure it out. Because you go like, all right, like we, we, you know, like we can, we can reduce the amount of shots here. We can do this here. We don't need that many extras there. Like we can make that choice because like, you know, I really want this to look like this or I want this to sort of exist there. So, I, you know, but no, nobody came around with cash. <laughs> Fair enough. Nobody, yeah. Fair enough. Um, now, I just have a few questions I, I ask all my guests. Uh, it's okay. like a rapid fire. If you could go back to your younger self, what would you tell him? Um, somebody else asked me this recently. Not, not to, you know, like call you unoriginal. Or <laughs> you know, Scott, I'm quite offended. No, it's okay. <laughs> I just, no, I meant like more like I, somebody just asked me this. And, you know, I'm, it, it's probably more insight in the way my brain works. Is like I take it so literally. I don't. It's like that. I'm like I don't think I would say anything. I don't know what I would say. I don't know what could. Because everything I know is is or every 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 like conclusion I've reached that has any value in my life is because of the experiences I went through. You know, right. and I don't, and I think you could go back to your younger self and be like, you know, buy Apple. <laughs> I guess that would be. <laughs> yeah, buy Apple at seven dollars. Yeah, buy Apple at seven dollars. Buy buy Facebook at thirty. You have three thousand dollars from your car sale. I know this won't make any sense, but buy Apple. 
Like, no, buy, 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 in 2021, there's going to be a GameStop. Buy GameStop. Yes. <laughs> it would probably be that. Like, as opposed to giving me any fucking advice of like how your career, because here's the thing, like my career in a way makes no sense, even to me. Right. Like, it's not, like, there's no linear line. Like, I can't point to it and tell somebody, like... This is what I did. You should do this. Yeah. I was just like, I I followed my curiosity, which is what I do now. You know, I still just sort of go, I'm not, I'm not sort of, I'm driven by my curiosity of, like, animation or this or that. And I kind of, like, which is why my IMD page is kind of a weird mishmash of producing and documentaries. And, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I love documentaries. Like I'll go in that direction. Like, you know, I, I sort of follow, I don't, I'm not like, I'm not like I make horror movies or I make, you know, rated R comedies. Like I just love, I, from the time I was a kid, like I just love film. I mean, my, my sort of taste in music is the same as, in film which is really diverse i just watch a lot of different things and so yeah i mean honestly that at the end of the day you know i i I try to hack the whole sit like what's the path i can take okay should i try to do what kevin did no okay maybe what i do what robert did no okay maybe what i do with richard link like and i'm not the only filmmaker we all do that like at one point you know you start looking at other people like you guys were doing it with richard you guys were doing it with slacker like literally that was what you were trying to do but at the end of the day it's 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 a lot of luck right place right time like you happen to run into kevin smith you two happen to gel. He happened to have a script about clerks, and then and then and off you go. And it happened in the early '90s when that was a fertile ground for something like that to kind of take off. Like you said, would that if it would happen in '85? Is there a? I don't know. Does it happen in in 2005? But you know, I always tell people this: like if Robert shows up with El Mariachi today. I'm not sure he breaks through with El Mariachi today. But in 91, a $7,000 action movie shot on 16 was exactly what the industry needed. It was the proof like, oh my God, someone made a movie for $7,000 or the story they sold at least. I think, if, I think if Robert was, if you, you know, to me, like if you transplant it, like the $7,000 version of El Mariachi that Robert would have made would have been very, very different. So oh, with, today, with today's tech, you're right. Yeah. You're he absolutely right. He could calculate that he could have sort of done it because, like, yeah, the, there's like the thing that I still go back to, and you know, it's not about people's career paths are. Look, it is about who you know, making connections, like meeting people, having like a, a deep sort of list of people that you know people that are making movies. I mean, it starts in film school. Like Mm -hmm. if you know enough people, you're working on shorts and like, it doesn't even matter if the shorts very good. You're just trying to get experience, right? Like that's like, you're a good worker. You work hard. You can fucking push a dolly, whatever. Like for me, like that's a big part of it. But I also think like, and this is specific to people who want to be writers, you know, writer, writer, directors and stuff like that. I think it's like, you know, the thing, it goes back to having that unique voice. Like, what mm-hmm. what's the story that only you can tell, you know? And at the end of the day, like, El Mariachi, Slacker, is, like, very, like, all those guys had one thing in common, which is they really wanted to tell that story. Not because it, they really wanted to tell that story. And not because it was the, the, I, the cheap idea. That, to me, is, like, always, like, people are, like, yeah. Well, I really want to make this, but they're like, but then I, you know, I came up with a cheap idea. It's like, well, no, 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 like come up with ideas. And like, if all your ideas are $80 million, then you might have a problem. But, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, but, but like, if you, if like, if your passion isn't in these cheap ideas, like everyone's going to know it. <laughs> you're absolutely, you know, I've never really, I really never quantified it the way you, you stated because you're absolutely right. Like, you know, when I, when I make my movies, you know, the ones that sing are the ones that I really wanted to do. And the ones that were like, I'm going to try to be this guy or I'm, this is going to get me to that next level. Or this is going to be the one that gets me the agent or the man. 
those don't they fall they fall flat you know and the ones that have all the passion and the voice are the ones that people really connect to and that's something that filmmakers trying to break in today really don't get um and and that is the thing that will cut through you're absolutely right that is the thing that will cut through all the noise well because if you're i mean look if you have to go talk about the movie you're making you know that's the simplest part of the equation it's like if you're passionate about it it for hours you know mm-hmm. if, if you made it as some sort of vehicle i mean the amount of people i've known through the years like well i'm doing this but what i really want to do is that and i'm like i was like i get it but i was like you have to find like everything should be an extension of your passion you can do things just to learn right those are the two levels if you want to go make a film that you're just like because you can because you can afford to do it and learn and become a better director or become a better whatever, there's value in that, right? But you have to know that the end result of that is that you've learned, you know? If you want to, the other reason to make something is like, what are you fucking excited about? Like, what are you passionate about? Like, what kind of stories are you passionate about? Like, is it, you know, like if you love horror movies, then it's like, that's great. Well, what's the personal version of a horror horror movie? You know, I mean, if you look at Jordan Peele, it's like that's why those movies are fucking amazing because they're personal. Like, it's not he didn't invent horror. He basically was like, but this is my perspective of what a horror movie is. Right. And suddenly everyone's like, holy shit! Like, you are the you are the only version of you. And I'm not saying you're a unique snowflake, but you we're all unique snowflakes. Sir. We're all unique snowflakes. Your perception or your take or your sort of joke on, um, like, if you throw something on a table and everyone makes a joke, like, there'll be ten different jokes, right? Like, that's what makes you different. And the more you sort of push yourself to find that, and that to me is like was a very long process. Like, I at 21, like, I did not have a voice. Like, I like. And it was having Kevin was like such a great, that was part of the benefit of standing next to Kevin. It's because I was like, that's what a voice is. Like, that's what it means. That's what it means to have a voice. That's what it means to cut through the noise, right? Because all the rest of it is noise. And so it, I was very aware of how long it would sort of take me to develop my own voice. Like I, the whole time I was like going like, that's a voice, right? Kevin's the voice. Like, no one can argue that. You may not like the voice, but the <laughs> motherfucker has got his own voice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a million people, the Coen brothers, like all, yeah. you know. like they, they, a, Yeah, Rick, Rick, Richard Linkletter, all those guys. Yeah, they all have a voice. You're absolutely right. Even, even Robert, like, even Robert who makes those kind of action. and But that's, that, that's his voice inside all those movies. And And that's the, like, that becomes the, you can learn how to you can learn how to edit, you can learn all the technical stuff, and all that stuff is smart. Like that's basically just making you better at your job. But if you want to tell your story, if you if you want to be a writer, director, you know, you really have to find your the most important thing you can do is find your voice. Um, two last questions. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? It's find your voice. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Find the to voice. Find your, to find your voice. And like part of the reason about finding your voice is that finding your, through the process of finding your voice, what you will do is create confidence in what your voice is. You know, it's, it's like, there's two, there's, there's all these, there's all these positives that come towards really taking a deep dive and be like, what kind of stories do I want to tell? Like, what do I get emotional when I watch? Like, what do I want to create, recreate on the screen? Like, you know, some of those basic questions of like, oh, when I watch it, like, I love to make people piss their pants laughing. I like to make people shit their pants. <laughs> I'm fucking like, <laughs> scary. Or, like, if, if these are all the, like, we're all here because we're like, uh, movies make us, um, movies evoke emotions. They make us feel things. And I really, like, for me, part of the process was going like, well, what are, what are the things that I love to feel when I'm watching a movie? And therefore, that's the thing that I don't want to recreate in my own movies. And so locating that, like, you know, what's the thing that you're like, oh, fuck. Like, when I go watch a movie and, 
and like I'm terrified, like I just walk away and I'm like I'm joyous. I'm so excited. If that's it, then you should focus on that. Like if you're like, no, I love to make people feel like life is worth, you know, like I like to make people cry. I don't, you know, like all those things exist and it's sort of it's almost like finding your voice to me is more about focusing on like what's the emotions that you like to evoke in the kind of content you're making. Because that's part of like what will help you fill out the kind of stories you want to tell, which is right. like, what's the emotional impact you're looking for? <clears throat> Anger, rage, love, all, like all of those things. Like those are the things to sort of think about. So yeah, finding <clears throat> finding finding my voice is like probably the biggest thing. And three of your favorite films of all time. Um, I mean, there's so many. Um, I'll I'll just sort of rattle some off. Um, well, I'll, I'll go way back to the beginning. Like Time Bandits is a huge. That's so good, Terry man, Terry Gilliam. Such oh. a huge. Um, the ones that like, sh- you know, for me, it's always like ones that shift your perception about you know what a film is are the ones that really stick in my mind. And there's tons of amazing movies that don't necessarily do that, but like Time Bandits was a big one for me. Um, Raising Arizona was another one, like really early on where I was like, I just, I just ate it up and, you know, and then, man, I can go on and on. I mean, like Fight Club is a one later on in life where I was like, so completely just like, fuck. What am I doing? Yeah, just like, just like, <laughs> fuck, I want to walk like, and then I just watch it like a hundred times. But, you know, eight and a half was another like, right. just mind blowing sort of experience from like, you know, where you're in that space, you're like, this is a movie. Like, that was the exciting part about being young is like, you're constantly like watching so many things. And that experience of being like, wait, 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 wait. I'm constantly redefining what a movie is through everything I'm watching. Like that's the sort of, those are the movies and like Time Bandits, Raising Arizona, Eight and a Half, and Fight Club is one where I was like, fuck, I was sort of being like, oh, okay, like I'm, I'm kind of pivoting and going like, this is a movie. I mean, when I, when I, I mean, I had, I've had Jim who wrote Fight Club on the show and uh, I just geeked out with him and Fincher and basically anything Fincher does, you just walk by and just like, what, what's this, yeah. what are we, what are we doing really? I mean, yeah. And I've talked to some I've talked to some amazing filmmakers and anytime Fincher comes up, they just say it's like I don't I just I don't even know what we're doing here. <laughs> it's 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 having one of those like it's like Kubrick when Kubrick would pop out with a movie, you're just like, What what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Scott, man, thank you so much for being on the show, brother. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you, man. And I wish you uh, nothing but success exploring your new wants and, and and things that excite you wherever wherever you go. And I hope that IMDb um, account gets a little bit more broad and, and crazy. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs>